some heads up as we look to uh, Luke 8, 1 through 21 and read through this. Uh, some key verses, verse 15, you'll want to be able to fill in these blanks as you hear the scripture. Jesus says, but that in the good soil, these are those who something with the word, something uh, in an honest and good heart, and something with Perseverance. I wonder what those verbs are going to be. What's going to fill in these blanks? Verse 19 of Luke chapter 8. Therefore, take care, Jesus says. He says, take care of something. We better focus on what he says take care about. Because to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he thinks he has will be taken away. And then finally, the climactic verse of the whole passage or whole segment of Scripture We've been looking at it for three weeks now. We arrive at it today. It's the final climactic verse. Jesus says, my mother and my brothers are those who do something and do something else vis-a-vis the word of God. We want to fill in those blanks, so let's open God's word to Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 21. We'll read this in toto. Remember, this is at the beginning of cycle 2 of Jesus' public ministry in Galilee and the surrounding area. Really important here as we head into this phase of Jesus' public ministry. Hear now God's word. And it happened soon afterwards. He was going through town and village, preaching and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve, that means the twelve apostles, were with him. And also certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. Joanna, the wife of Clusa, Herod's household manager. Susanna, and many others who were providing for them out of their own means. They were financing the ministry. These women who were with Jesus. Verse 4, and when a large crowd was gathering and those from each town came to him, he spoke by a parable. The sower went out to sow his seed, and in his sowing some fell along the path, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. Other seed fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away, having no moisture. Other seed fell in among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And other seed fell into the good soil, and growing up, it brought forth fruit a hundredfold. As he said these things, he, Jesus, called out, the one who has ears to hear, let him hear. Then his disciples asked him what this parable might mean. He said, to you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but for the rest they are in parables. So that, quoting Isaiah here now, Isaiah 6, 9, Seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now, the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so they may not believe and be saved. The ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. But these have no root. They who believe for a while, and in time of testing, fall away. And as for what fell into the thorns, these are those who hear, but as they make their way, are choked under the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and they bring forth no fruit to maturity. But that in the good soil. These are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and bring forth fruit with perseverance. No one, verse 16, Jesus continues, no one, after lighting a lamp, covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Therefore, Take care, watch how you hear. Because to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he thinks he has will be taken away. 
Then his mother and brothers came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he, Jesus, answered them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Today, we continue to focus in on what I would call the kingdom calculus, the mystery, the open secret, the open secret of the gospel of grace. And this takes us to some key points, some key proclamations. These are awesome. You cannot outgive God. You cannot outgive God, the ultimate giver. And everything actually is God's in the first place and at the end. <laughs> It all, it's all God's. Debtors under the gospel who know that they have received total grace, not they did some good things and they got a little bit from God. No, who have received total grace, knew they were dead, brought to life by total grace, and God's forgiveness in Jesus Christ. They love much, just like the sinful woman at the end of Luke chapter 7, crying over Jesus' feet, anointing his feet, lavishly spending her whole fortune on anointing his feet. They love much. Jesus commends her for that. And they keep receiving sola gratia by grace alone all the way into God's eternal heaven. It's an awesome thing about the gospel. On the other hand, though, this is part of the gospel calculus, the kingdom calculus. Those who think they have salvation but cling to their lives, their families, their children, their stuff, their money. They don't have what they think. It will be taken away. Luke 8, 19. Jesus says, therefore, key verse for us today, therefore, take care how you hear. I mean, if, if you're showing up in church, you're kind of hearing, Jesus says, take care how you hear. There are a lot of people gathering around Jesus, claiming to be disciples, claiming to be interested in him. He says, it, the, the issue is how you hear. Take care of how you hear. Because to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he thinks he has will be taken away. Christ's word, the gospel of grace, from our all giving, it's what grace means, all giving, total grace, grace alone, all giving God and his kingdom of grace. I mean, he's so awesome. God is so awesome. I want you to love this God. God is awesome. He sows his seed on dust, on the dirt, on the soil, and brings forth a harvest of life. Isn't that awesome? He forgives his enemies. That's you and me. That's sinners. He forgives his enemies. He raises the dead, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Well, he raises dust to eternal life and glorious communion with him in heaven. I mean, how, how great is this all-giving God? Again, the kingdom calculus, though. The gospel of grace. You cannot outgive this God who is so awesome, who is so full of grace. Everything is his. Men, you know we're in Revelation on Tuesday morning, so you'll know this. Revelation chapter 7, verse 10. Salvation itself belongs to our God. I've got my salvation. No, no, no. If you think it's yours, <laughs> it will be taken away from you. And salvation belongs to the Lord, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Salvation belongs to God. Everything is God's. That's the kingdom calculus. That's what grace is all about. The gospel is all about. Christ's own, his own people. This is great. The more they hear and do his giving word, his grace word, his word is about giving, the more they do his giving word, the more they give and the more they receive and have. That's what Jesus teaches us. Give it away, receive. It's awesome. For to the one who has, more will be given. But nominal believers and kind of your classic American or Western style transactional guy who says, well, I made this, I, I, I said the words right. I raised my hand, I signed the card, or I kind of did this or that. The nominal believers, the less they truly hear his word, in other words, the more it's in one ear and out the other, the more 
well, yeah, I did go to church, but like I forgot what they said, and I certainly didn't talk about it with my children or my spouse. We certainly didn't give the Lord the Lord's Day like after kind of checking off my box and showing up at worship. The less they truly hear his word of grace, the more they reject. I mean, it just builds in. It's like a cancer or a bad habit. The less you are into the word, the less and less you're into the word. I don't know it. we don't do that. I don't talk about it with my kids. I don't talk about it with my spouse or my friends. It's not my thing. Yeah, that's going to continue. That's a cycle into death. So Jesus says, even what they think they have, life eternal in the kingdom, it'll be taken away from them. Guys, you know we're getting this in Revelation too from Jesus. They are just like, these people are just like the self-righteous religious Jews who thought they knew God and had God. And Jesus says, you don't even begin to know God. You're not even recognizing me when I've come in the flesh. You claim you have God. You know God. You claim you are chosen by God. No way, Jesus says. You're not responding to my call for you to repent and come clean and humble yourself before God. You don't know who he is. You don't know who I am. Am I in his family? Jesus says, fill in the blanks, you should be able to do this pretty easily. My mother and my brothers are those who do a couple things, who hear, like really hear, and who do, who put into practice, poeo, the word of God. My mother and my brothers, this is who's going to be with me, okay, who's with me now, and who's going to be with me, my mother and my brothers are those who hear and do the word of God. Now, remember our overview. We've given this a couple weeks. Let's go through it again. Luke 8, 1 through 21, beginning of the second cycle of the public ministry. Jesus, by his word, creates a church of hearers and doers who bring forth fruit. Cycle 1, Jesus himself proclaims the word and enacts the word. Power in word and in deed. Now he's calling together a communion, a church family, a family of people who, mirroring him in a sense at our lower level, hear and do the word. Jesus preaches and brings kingdom gospel. In verses 1 through 3, we see this. It's the framer on the front end of this larger passage. A communion of people who, who know the word and who live by it, a koinonia. So Jesus is bringing forth a church, a developing church here, of people who are with him, who support him in stewardship, who are giving their lives to him. That's what it means to be a disciple. Then verses 4 through 18, Jesus teaches by way of parables on the kingdom mysteries and about hearing and living the word fruitfully as actual disciples. So it's not just now Jesus doing it. He's calling his people to reflect him in their lives. First of all, last Sunday, you can go back and listen to it. If you missed last Sunday's sermon, you want to listen to it paired with this one. A uh, lot deeper on the parable of the soils, the disciples' question, the explanation of why the parables, and the meaning of this particular parable of the seed and the soils. But now, today, we're going to move on to and reflect back and forth on that previous one on verses 16 through 18. And here is Jesus' follow-up explanation to his disciples about the parable of the seed and the soils coming from that into a message about the stakes of hearing and doing. So he says this, after he's explained the parable of the soil, no one, after lighting a lamp, covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed. A lot of little humor there with Jesus, and he apparently said this regularly because we see this interspersed through the Gospels, this statement. You put a lamp under a straw bed, what happens? You've got a fire in the house. It's not a good light, right? It's a, like a, a hellish situation. Uh, but you don't want to cover it up either. Uh, no one lighting a lamp covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand so that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be made known and come to light. What's he talking about? He's talking about judgment. So, Jesus makes clear that in the parable of the soils and now in life, everything depends on how you hear. 
if you are awake to the word and alive in the word or asleep. I mean, this is the big difference. And he says that his word brings both a couple things. A, salvation, you can fill that in. But also B, judgment. And in fact, this is the gospel. This is the axis of the gospel. A is through B. Salvation is through judgment. You could say, I like salvation, but don't tell me about judgment on me. Well, I'm telling you the only way you can be saved is to be brought through judgment. That's what the cross is all about. The cross is salvation through judgment on us and Jesus taking our place. The judgment is on us, but he takes it on himself. That's what the gospel centers on. That's what the cross is about. When we talk about being justified by faith, it means being judged but found righteous in Christ, justification by faith in him, not, by the way, in ourselves. Justification by faith in ourselves is going to kill us. So we get Jesus' wake-up call, therefore, take care, and the answer there is how you hear. Now let's dig into this verse. Therefore, Christians, parents who teach your children how to read the Bible, every time you see a therefore, what's your question? What's your question to your children? Ask them that. You know, they're supposed to know this. You're supposed to know this. What is the therefore? Therefore. And it's linking you to something that you've just read. In this case, to what Jesus has just taught. So Jesus has just explained about the parable of the soils. Do you get it? And then he says, therefore, let me expand this further into salvation through judgment. And it's all in or all out with me. That's what the lamp and the explanation is going to be about it's all in or all out for me. Therefore, let, let me make this very clear about the soil and the good hearts versus the other kind of soil. It's all in or all out. By the way, this is a message on the perseverance and productivity of the saints. That side of Tulip. This is not a message on assurance of salvation. This is primarily Jesus has taken us all the way to the P and the perseverance and productivity of those who are truly belonging to him. So, uh, he says... There's some in the good soil. Hearing the word, they hold it fast and are honest and good heart and bring forth fruit with perseverance. Jesus says in Matthew 24, those who persevere to the end will be saved. Jesus says in John 15, those who remain in me, not just for a fleeting moment, but those who actually remain in me through the testing, they will bear much fruit. If they don't remain in me, they won't bear fruit and they'll be thrown into the fire. Okay? All these things link up. Jesus says, therefore, therefore to all of that, therefore, take care. Literally, the Greek here is, look at, watch, watch, blepita. It's an imperative, and it means look at. It's kind of funny, right? Look at how you're listening. <laughs> therefore, take care, watch how you listen. Akuate, and that's present tense ongoing. Therefore, watch how you hear. Interesting, Jesus is an itinerant preacher. He says a lot of these sayings over and over again. In Mark, we get him emphasizing something that pairs with this. He says, take care what you hear. Because you could hear the parts you like, but not the parts you don't like, right? So that relates to how you hear. Take care. You, you better take the whole message in, not just the little tidbits and, and themes you like. Take care of what you hear. And by the way, in, in Mark 4, 24, he says, take care, watch what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And still more will be added to you. So Jesus says, therefore, take care how you hear, because to the one who has, more will be given. From the one who has not, even what he thinks he has will be taken away. Notice this, how you hear. Jesus is, if you know your Hebrew Bible, which obviously Jesus authored and he knows, okay, you need to know this, you need to know these connections. This is a theme that runs through the Old Testament. Let me take you to one really obvious example on both hearing and productivity and fullness or things taken away. Listen to this. Pro take care how you hear. Proverbs 9, 8. Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man and he will love you. Two totally different ways of hearing. Y'all, a fool and a scoffer is not going to like reproof. A wise man is going to appreciate and say, thank you for redirecting me. I was getting too proud. I was hanging on to stuff that really belongs to God. 
They're going to hear totally different. Jesus says, take care how you, now notice the consequences of this. Take care how you hear. Proverbs 9, 9. Give to a wise man and he'll be still wiser. In other words, he has and he'll get more. The way he hears, right? Teach a righteous man and he will increase in learning. But the scoffer, the fool, is going to lose even what he thinks he's holding on to. Because Jesus says, to the one who has, more will be given. From the one who has not, even what he thinks he has will be taken away. Now, Jesus identifies, as we've been saying, his true heart family as hearers and doers who love much. Just like the sinful woman whom he had forgiven, lavishly, lavishly worshiped and giving to Jesus at the end of Luke chapter 7. Much fruit. And Jesus says, my mother and my brothers are hearing and doing. Okay? Literally, it's ongoing, and the poet over there is putting it into practice, like making it happen. And you could say, well, wait a minute, Pastor Martin. I'm, you know, I know that Jesus keeps saying this, but I'm a Reformed Protestant, and so I don't like all this talk that Jesus just repeatedly does all the way through the New Testament about works and fruit. And I could say, well, you may want to read Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, in connection with Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. But let me take you to uh, the kind of supreme magisterial exegete and reformed theologian John Calvin. Here's what he says, to put it simply. Faith alone justifies, but faith that justifies is never alone. Faith alone justifies, but faith that justifies is never alone. This is in his exegesis of Ezekiel chapter 18. Anyway, he goes on and says this. Faith cannot justify without works. Why? Because it's dead. If there's nothing going on with worship and giving and serving, it's a bogus dead faith. Calvin says, faith can no more be separated from works than the sun from its heat. Truly saved by grace, Christians will persevere and glorify God by their mission, by their fruit. You will be the light of the world, Jesus says, and they'll glorify my Father in heaven because of your what? Works. So who is with Jesus? Remember frame one, the 12, certainly we expected them, and then all these women who've been saved by Jesus and who love him so much that they're giving their resources to finance his ministry out of their means. Go to the back end frame. 19 through 21, Jesus identifies his true family as those who love much, like the sinful woman, and bring forth fruit. They hear and do. Okay, let's go back to last Sunday, pair this with last Sunday. Remember our concerns with the parable of the soils. Unguarded hearts for adults and children, shallow hearts, Overscheduled and distracted hearts. Just don't have time for the whole thing. I'm sorry, I just don't. I've got to go. I've got things to do, people to see. And of course, we're dealing here with the reality of spiritual warfare. Now go to the parable of the lamp, how we hear. And there you have it. So what can we do in response, Christians? Okay, I've got three for you. Stay with Jesus, number one. Receive his word, the gospel of total grace, in repentance, humble repentance and faith. Remember that the gospel is not about your achieving, but about your receiving. I mean, it's an awesome gospel. This is not about like making myself do a bunch of stuff that I don't want to do. This is about, you know, are you willing to open your heart, okay? Um, saving knowledge is not achieved, but received. Let me take you to a couple verses that we just read. Verse 10. Luke 8, he said, to you had has been given, given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. To Donai is the verb there. Verse 18, therefore take care how you hear because to the one who has much more will be what? Given. But this is not passive. If you're with me on Wednesday nights doing discipleship study, if you want to grow in discipleship, you know we've been on sanctification the last couple of weeks on Wednesday night. And we've been talking about how there's a dimension of sanctification that is our participation in God's work with us. Remember this, folks? Okay, same thing here. Not passive, but participatory. Just like with sanctification. 
So number two, ask questions. I have good news for you. One of my favorite verses in this passage, actually as a fallback, is chapter 8, verse 9. Because what happens there? After Jesus tells the parable of the soil and the seeds, right? Do all the apostles get it automatically? And I'm sitting there saying, oh, wow, I guess I'm like not even a Christian because they all got this automatically and I don't know. What do they do in verse 9? They go and ask Jesus. We don't get this, Jesus. Could you please help us out? And Jesus doesn't say, be gone from you, you ignorant people, forever. Simon, James, and John, Mary Magdalene, you're all out now. No. He answers when we ask. Ask, and it will be what? Given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open. Be in the church family. Ask questions. Pursue his word. Pray. Come back into the church family. Come back into your Sunday school, your Wednesday night groups, your Tuesday morning groups. Ask questions. Grow in the word. Learn how to receive the word. Though Jesus says the mystery has been given to them, they needed to ask, right? They were like probably a lot of us. We don't get it immediately. Doesn't mean you're not saved. It means you need to grow, right, in the word. And then number three, hear and do, receive and give. No one, after lighting a lamp, covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand so that those who enter, this means like the Gentiles, other people coming, they are supposed to be able to see the light. Jewish apostles, I want you to have your light on so that the Gentiles can come to me and see. That's what Jesus is talking about right there. This is great commission talk. This is the family's great commission. If you're a Christian, if you're in the church, you're on fire for the great commission, bringing the word to your own community and throughout the world. Active seeking of the word and active sharing of his mission. So here we come to the majesty, the mystery of his kingdom of grace, the kingdom calculus, the gospel of grace. And here's good news for Christ's own. The more we hear and do his word, the more we receive and the more we give and the more we receive. Because God is a continual ultimate giver unto life eternal. For to the one who has, more will be given. So this answers the question, who's with Jesus? His family of disciples who are growing in hearing the word and growing in doing the word. Come home, family. Come home to him. Love him. Believe him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.